Um, I'm Brendan Howell. I'm uh, an American media artist, an engineer, and I live here in Berlin. And we're doing Insecure Territories. It's a three-day workshop here in our studio in Neukölln. And um, yeah, we're trying out various different experiments and interventions, and um, yeah, we'll see what comes up. Uh, insecure Territories is sort of a notion that there are all these um, electromagnetic radiation and that our culture now has developed to a point where this uh, a lot of our communication takes place over this medium. So it's everywhere, no matter if you're using a mobile phone or your computer, you're, even if you're not online at that moment, you're actually producing electromagnetic radiation. But it's also interesting because we're, uh, it's this sort of invisible thing out there and most people don't think about it because you can't see it other than when the router breaks. So um, yeah, we're investigating that and in, we started off with a, in a formal way and then we're getting into today is especially practical where we're actually um, using these things and, and going out and, and looking at what signals are out there, what our everyday electro smog environment looks like and um, what we can do as artists to, to play with this medium. Is this waves and networks around us, is this generally a bad thing or a good thing for you? Uh, I guess I'm, I haven't put so much of a, a value on it one way or another. It's, to me it's interesting because it's there. Uh, I mean in some ways it's really convenient, you know, you don't have to plug yourself in. You know, you just need enough power on your phone or your uh, laptop and you can go wander around the block and still be online. So that's a sort of simple convenience thing that I think is the, the main selling point for most people. There's plenty of speculation though because once you start to actually measure these things you realize how much we're blasting all kinds of weird radiation out and um, you know if you've ever uh, seen the safety precautions they do with things like x-rays you recognize that um, yeah, this electromagnetic spectrum, or if you've ever burned yourself on a light bulb, you know that um, there's a lot of energy produced and that that's going to eventually come in contact with particles, say, in our body, our brains, wherever, and it may have side effects. So, yeah, it's uh, potentially scary, but um, nobody can really conclusively say it's bad or good or it's so convenient that it it's worth it. And how much possibility does one have to kind of like interfere with it or deal with it or even kind of like maintain their own way of using it? Or is it more like something God given or technology given and you kind of, I don't know if that's what I can do with it, but that's it. How much empowerment is possible towards this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it's, there's a whole spectrum. I mean, in some ways, uh, on the first day we started and we um, took a, a totally analog approach and, and tried to sort of reinvent the internet just using um, optical or non-technical um, means mm -hmm. beyond, you know, a few staples and a piece of wood and a bit of fabric. Um, Can you and, elaborate a little bit? And so, well, in that case, yeah, one group of participants, they came up with a sort of flag semaphore-like system. So they um, uh, spent most of their time developing the protocol, the language, because that was a difficult part. And then they took about 10 minutes, got some fabric from a junk store that around the corner, some scrap wood out of the basement, stapled these flags together, and then we went to the runway at Tempelhof Park, and we tested out their system, did a little bit of fine-tuning, figured out some things didn't quite work. But in the end, um, yeah, we sort of had a, a, a very primitive but effective system to send a message between two people who couldn't or more people actually who, who couldn't necessarily uh, talk to each other or you know reach each other through other existing technical means. And in that case, basically, the system was line of sight or some kind of like visibility yeah. in general, and you mm -hmm. just sort of like agreed on some kind of code to communicate exactly. in it. Yeah, uh -huh. and so there were. So sort of data, different ways. They had a, a reduced sort of alphabet 
of messages you could send, and then there were some sort of control signals. So you could say, uh, stop, stop, no, I didn't get that, or please repeat. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, it's not going to supplant the uh, mobile phones or anything like that, but in a way you could, without any real technical means, produce something that could eventually be as complicated as the internet. Of course, mm. it would take 20 years, but um, it, it's, it's something that you don't necessarily need to be an engineer. And in some ways, you, you recognize that these protocols that we have that are sort of standards, in some ways, they're very arbitrary and they're more products of history in the way things just played out. So the second day, we then got a bit more technical. But we, again, we started at a really low level. We didn't want to necessarily um, yeah, make, make, make it this, as you were sort of implying, a sort of high priesthood of engineers. And you know that, that you have to have this really um, multi-layered, deep knowledge just to get started with this stuff. So we said, no, you, you really don't. You can start to see these things right away. And the, the basic notion is that in any, any time you're using electricity, if elect, an electrical um, voltage changes, you produce a magnetic field, which produces some sort of radio, um, yeah, radiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can pick that up by just taking an old AM radio. And so we did some experiments just taking old radios from the junk shop where we got the fabric and putting them next to various different devices that we had and, and looking at what sounds came out of them. And then we could also do simple experiments just with a, a little coil and um, magnets, you know, picking up different signals from motors, mobile phones, hard drives, things like that. Just want to get back to this one thing that you actually sort of through audio basically managed to use some kind of almost side effect of the of the pre-existing waves. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious because in a way it reminds me of generally artistic research who is never which is never kind of like identical to I don't know scientific, official yeah. scientific technological research. How, mm -hmm. What is your opinion on kind of like how the artist sort of researches and yeah, generates I we, things? We sort of take a, a slightly naive approach which is fun and it also means that you don't have to be concerned with because the goals are obviously different you know the for the artist success has a very different definition than the scientist the scientist wants reproducible results uh -huh. whereas the artist probably would almost or at least sometimes would prefer the really one-off non-reproducible results the sort of magical or you could even say paranoid result um, and so how did you call that one-off result? What does that mean? Uh, it's, it means that essentially, the, I mean, with a, a science, I mean, good science is defined by something that you make a certain claim and that it can be reproduced in somebody else's lab. So you know, you write a paper about it, describe your procedure, show your data, your results, and your explanation for it, and somebody else can take that same, just read the paper and reproduce it in another lab. Whereas for us, as Artists, I guess, we're not really concerned with that. And I think most artists would like to think that they're somewhat unique in the experiments they're doing. So maybe they don't even want anyone to really reproduce it, maybe to, to riff on it or to mm -hmm. remix it in some way, but not necessarily copy it. But um, I guess in that sense, then we, we're not, yeah, we're not trying to produce knowledge and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, this sort of, notion of scientific progress or artistic progress I think is for me anyways is questionable so we're more interested in yeah having a result that's interesting but probably not necessarily reproducible but doesn't that lead us almost to a paradox situation that you as an artist sort of like have your special interests in mm -hmm. dealing with things and I think you're even the word unique sort of magic occurred here mm -hmm. and on the other hand you have this workshop situation where the goal actually is to sort of share and sort of yeah make something reproducible in a way like true yeah okay in that sense we're not yeah we're not trying to um 
simply have accidents that we can't explain, you know, uh -huh. that we're just sort of randomly combining uh, components or things like that. But um, I guess for us, it's, it's like this thing where we're dealing, we're working in this technical or scientific media. So you do need a certain amount of um, engagement with the, the, the science or the physics or the engineering involved so that you can understand it to the level where you can play with it. Uh -huh. So you need a certain level of familiarity with the, the material. And I guess that's one thing that we're trying to impart. But I would say that's not the primary goal. I mean, if that were the primary goal, then we wouldn't bother with these artistic approaches. We would just do a seminar on Maxwell's equations and electromagnetic physics. But for us, I guess that's not as much fun. It's not as... Um, yeah, it, it lacks that sort of critical engagement. So we take it a step beyond that and um, I guess look at, at ways that we can twist these notions or these conventions. I also think there's another difference to like official fine arts artists who sort of like put their special way of things and their identity mm -hmm. up front, whereas my impression in media arts, that is kind of, you need some kind of community or at least kind of network to work within or work with instead of kind of like showing them your glorious thing, especially with the workshop situation. Of yeah. Creation, it's kind of yeah, there's definitely not this, uh, yeah, the heroic, you know, the, the guy standing on the hill with his beret on and his, he's got his uh, canvas there and he's waiting for the muse to strike. I think with, um, but with a lot of artists, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to imply that all non-media artists work this way, or, but I, I guess that um, definitely there's a notion of working in a maybe I don't mean this to sound insulting, but somewhat pseudo-scientific way mm -hmm. or a sort of research-oriented way. And I think if you're doing research, generally you need somebody to bounce ideas off of. You need other people to give you feedback. And if you're dealing with this um, this milieu where you have really complicated stuff that nobody can really understand completely, you need other people to to also give you feedback or just point you in the right direction. Well, one thing that I enjoy about workshops is, I mean, you can take a lot of different forms, but generally the, the one that I like is where the people leading the workshop essentially come in and introduce a few um, examples, practices, maybe some background in the physics or the, the programming techniques involved, whatever it is. Um, but then it's people sort of just get excited about playing with it and potentially have ideas for a direction they could go with it. And so, um, everyone in the workshop is essentially hacking. You're trying to build something, either experiments or you have a particular goal, and um, you're just sort of working towards that. And some people work alone, but they want a little bit of feedback, you know, every once in a while. And some people are more interested in getting into a group or maybe just sort of following along with somebody who does have a crazy vision on that particular day. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's it's a, a social practice, and it's not um, it's not very heroic in the classic sense. Is there actually a potential to change the world? Oh, I mean, uh, it's a tough question. I don't know. I'm always skeptical of artists' ability to change the world. I think artists are doing something that's often more illustrative, that they're essentially reflecting the state of the world, that mm -hmm. they, um, they allow people to, to look at the world that they live in in a way that maybe they wouldn't otherwise through popular media or, you know, 
um, everyday life that you wouldn't necessarily see. So in terms of activism, I think artists can also be involved in certain forms of activism and that can be effective. I mean definitely with media art <laughs> there's plenty of um, examples of that. People that used their ideas and skills to um, contribute to political causes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say art's powerless, but I don't think that art is going to save the world. I think there's a lot of really boring practical stuff that's more important. Okay, one last question that I just need to include everywhere. It's going to Financial, how do you maintain or survive the artistic lifestyle? How do you finance it? Oh, personally, I guess the, the, my main gig is I teach at a design school here mm -hmm. in Berlin. And um, I'm not getting rich off of that, but it's, it's a nice, stable job. And it enables me to be engaged on one level with something that's practical and um, yeah, economically useful, at least society thinks so. Uh, but I also do workshops and I do a bit of programming and technical consulting on the side. Um, and then... What's the difference to something being economically useful? Well, I mean, that's just means somebody's willing to pay for it. That's really... My, I, I guess that's a kind of a weaselly definition, but that's the only one I can <laughs> come up with is that yeah, somebody's willing to pay you for it. So some artists are doing something that's economically viable because they can make enough to survive, but some don't. Uh, and so until you can, then you have to find something else. That's and transmediale as a context is not something that you'd say that pays... I'd say it's a little problematic and I, I was a little frustrated with things this year. I don't want to go start talking trash or, you know, blaming anyone in particular, but um, it's definitely frustrating that it's this sort of big thing that does take a lot of money, but then for a lot of individual artists, they end up walking away feeling exploited, <laughs> that they uh, weren't paid enough for their time. But at least the net culture media festival context is not the thing you would say it's an equivalent to economically. No, I think the problem with that is it's too, um, it's too hermetic. It's too much within itself. I mean, I think if you, if you want something to be economically viable, it needs to have a broad audience uh -huh. or a really huge patron but even then uh, then you're you're stuck working for that one person or institution so i think i guess if media art if we wanted to make this more economically viable such that a festival like transmediale could actually pay more people better uh then i think we need to figure out ways to make the profile higher in the audience broader. Mm.